Tonight, for the first time, we are in Govan in Glasgow, once the beating industrial heart of the city. The decline in shipbuilding has left a challenging legacy here. Child poverty, on average, is higher than the rest of the city. An average healthy life expectancy is six years lower than the rest of Glasgow as a whole. But millions are being spent on regeneration and development here. So what matters most to the people in this area? Let's find out. Welcome to Debate Night. Debate Night is the only show in Scotland where you get to put your questions to the people in power. Answering them on our panel this evening, businessman and promoter Donald MacLeod, spokesperson for the Nighttime Industries Association. He's also a veteran of Scotland's live music industry and this week celebrated 30 years in charge of one of Glasgow's most iconic music venues. From the Scottish Conservatives, Brian Whittle is MSP for the South of Scotland, a former Olympic Brian entered politics eight years ago and is now the party spokesperson for business, economic growth and tourism. Pam Duncan Glanstey is a Scottish Labour MSP for Glasgow. Pam worked for Public Health Scotland before being elected to Holyrood three years ago. A long-time campaigner on equalities and human rights, she's been active in the Labour Party for over 20 years. Also with us tonight, Darren McGarvey, an award-winning writer and musician, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and winner of the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. He has a new album out this year and a new book out next year. His new TV show, The State We Are In, begins next week on BBC Scotland. And finally, from the SNP, the MSP for Glasgow Proven, Ivan McKee. Ivan previously ran an international manufacturing consultancy and until last year was Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise. He was Director of Business for Scotland, making the economic case for yes. Please welcome them all to debate night. And of course, welcome to our studio audience. It's great to be here with you in Govan in Glasgow this evening. And you can join in the discussion from home. Wherever you are in Scotland, BBC DN is the hashtag you need right now on social media. Give us a follow as well, at BBC Debate Night. And our Debate Night podcast will be available for you to download straight after the show. So let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Nicola Biggerstaff. Nicola, good evening. Hi. Why are we letting party politics get in the way of calling for a ceasefire in Gaza? Thank you, Nicola. Today was an opportunity for Westminster to speak with one voice on this issue. Instead, uh, rouse walkouts by the SNP and the Conservatives. The Speaker back in the House apologising over the selection of amendments. Darren McGarvey. I watched as much of the debate as I could while caring for my young children at home. And while there are often uh, very thoughtful, considered contributions, there was a great deal of grandstanding going on as well. And that's before the kind of debacle that uh, occurred a bit later on in the day. I'm going to avoid talking about the spectacle of the grandstanding because I think what happens is it becomes an unhelpful distraction from what I believe that we should be focused on, which is that what's happening uh, in Palestine right now is, is an affront to any, any civilization, and that Britain, as it stands, has a lot of blood on its hands. Um, the debate today touched on issues around the two-state solution. It touched on issues around, you know, what should Hamas do, what is Israel's obligations. But a lot of the debate arises out of a very dangerous historical amnesia, which is set in in this part of the world generally, which is the privileging of an Israeli perspective over a Palestinian perspective. And I don't want to paint an unhelpful dichotomy, but even before the October 7th attack, Israel was in contravention of international law then. This peacetime that we talk about, this time where there was a ceasefire that Hamas obviously broke with its horrendous attacks, this was already a time where Israel was violating the spirit and the letter of accords that were signed to try and bring about a better situation over there. Aggressive expansion of territory, not fulfilling its obligations as an occupying force. And unfortunately, we, we should rely on our political class. We're always hearing about how posh they are and therefore how educated they are. And it's amazing how this whole debate is grounded in a version of reality which actually bears no resemblance to the reality. And it's a very heated debate, Darren, and you, you know that people will disagree with 
parts of what you said yeah, there, good. if not all of it this evening, and that's the nature of this debate. Brian Whittle, was today a good day for politics? No, it wasn't a very good day for politics at all. I think, you know, it's... it's uh, when we look at what went on down, down in Westminster, and you look at the, the, the motion, and you look at the two amendments, there's not a single MP down there who doesn't say, we need to stop the fighting. That we, need, we need to have, have humanitarian aid in there. We need, we need to get the hostages uh, released. There's not one single MP down there that disagrees with that. So, you're right, the, the grandstanding down there does politics no good whatsoever. And, and the way in which, which it, 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 it manifested itself into this debacle down there, that does Gaza and Israel no good whatsoever. That will not, not change one iota of what's happening over there. And actually what we need to, we, what the world needs to do is to have a much more grown-up discussion about this and look uh, 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 like the grown-ups in the room because anybody looking at that today, and, and by the way, no political party comes out of this with, with any credit whatsoever. Um, anybody looking at that today, it's not, it's not going to change one thing. And you've got to remember this. Everybody wants a ceasefire. But what happens after the ceasefire? It's, it's, that, that's actually what's really key here. Um, so we put, the, we put the finger on the button of the ceasefire. What happens when you take the finger off? We need, we need, to, uh, we need to have a solution at the end of this. Uh, we, you know, for me, when, when, before October the 7th, there was glim, glimmers of hope for me when, um, when there was a lot of, a, a lot of um, the dialogue, a lot of, 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 of trade was starting to go on between Israel and, and, and the rest of uh, in the Middle East out there, there was glimmers of hope we might be getting somewhere uh, at the end of this. And for me, the only people that, that, that uh, were against that were Iran, and they're the, one, they're the winners out of this. And so we've got to consider, I mean, it's, the, the killing has to stop. I mean, and it, it, nobody wins in a war. I mean, we look at, the, I th I've said this before, I think the world's on fire. We're talking about Palestine, and we're talking about Israel uh, being at war. But we look at the Yemen and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in Aleppo. And there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people dying in war. We, we, have, to, we have to stop that. Well, stop the, the that. question was about party politics yeah, getting in the way the of this. Of, uh, Ivan McKee, was this today between Labour and the SNP, this argument, more about Scotland, actually? Than about Gaza. No, not at all. It's about the, the tragic situation in, um, in, in Gaza, and, and not just in Gaza, across the West Bank as well. And, and I absolutely agree with pretty much everything that uh, Darren said on this. The, the historical context is hugely important. The reality of what's happening on the ground is important. Um, and this didn't start on October the 7th last year. This has been going on for 75 years, uh, on and off, right across that period. And even last year before. Uh, the, 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 the tragic attacks, the, the horrendous attacks on October the 7th. There was armed settlers killing Palestinian civilians in the West Bank. But how has the day Bank. changed anything? How well, has it hasn't, the day and that's, moved that's the point, that's the point I'm coming to. The SNP clearly put a motion down to talk about, uh, raise this hugely important issue, and people may agree or may not agree with that. Um, the winner of this, frankly, is the status quo, which Israel is able to carry on doing what it's doing without that political pressure being brought to, to uh, do what we can to stop that. But that's down to the that. politicians. It's not down to the people in this room or the people watching no, at absolutely home. right. Yeah, absolutely right. Th there should have been a debate there today about the, the critical importance of this issue, um, and there should have been a vote on what the ceasefire uh, and, and, and where people's perspective on that was. Because I, I have to disagree with, with Brian. You have to stop that killing immediately and then you've got the space to figure out what happens next. To say that you're not gonna, you're gonna keep on killing hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people every day, because you don't know what you're gonna do when you stop killing people, is a ridiculous position. So that's where it needs to get to. You have gotta remember, the, the only ceasefire there has been was a one week ceasefire. That was the period where hostages were released on both sides and people stopped dying for a week back in November, and we're now back to where we were. So the UK government has got a huge responsibility here as, as a world-leading government, putting pressure on Israel and on the US and on uh, others to bring about an immediate ceasefire. That opportunity was lost today um, because of the, 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 the ridiculous situation it got, got itself into. So that's hugely important, but frankly, it also shows up um, the dysfunctional nature of the Westminster system where they can't even get that right. We're having a debate in the Scottish Parliament tomorrow that I'm leaving on Gaza tomorrow afternoon, and I'm absolutely certain that will be conducted in a much more sensible, civilised uh, manner, focused on the important issues rather than what we saw in oh, the Okay, a uh, lady with a hand up right in the middle there first, the black and white top. Yes, on you go. I think, um, you know, saying or talking at Westminster or whatever, it makes no difference. We should be listening to what Netanyahu's saying. 
And what he is saying is he is not going to stop until 100% of a mass is wiped out. How do you know when you've got 100% of a mass? Only when you've killed everybody in Palestine. So that is what he's going for. Okay. Gentleman on the front row down here. Yes. Hamas, uh, acting as a, a proxy for Iran, have made it very clear that the minute there's a ceasefire, they're going to do the same thing again. Go in and butcher, rape, behead, murder, and take more hostages. Netanyahu has said, give us the hostages and we will stop. What's the problem? Give them the hostages. War over. Gentleman at the beard, right at the very back of the room. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would disagree with what the gentleman in the front row there said. There is no substantiation of any allegations of sexual assault on October the 7th. Oh, and secondly, oh, I would disagree sake. with the gentleman who's representing the Tory party that there were glimmers of hope. All that was, trade with other places is normalisation of an apartheid state. Okay. I'm not sure what information you're referring to, but I think there has been widespread international acceptance mm -hmm. that the events referred to by that gentleman did indeed take place on the 7th of October. Pam Duncan Glassy. What, what happened on the 7th of October was utterly, utterly abhorrent. And as we are having this discussion tonight, parts that are required for incubators for babies that need to get into the hospital in Gaza are not getting through because we do not have the humanitarian corridors that we need. We absolutely have to get to a situation where there is an immediate ceasefire, and I'm really proud that the, the party, um, the Labour Party tonight, a motion look, to propose the immediate ceasefire, but also use the language of the UN and other countries, including Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, all of which said we need an immediate ceasefire. We need to recognise that the 7th of October must never, ever happen again. Any insurgents from the Israeli army into Rafa must not happen, and there has to be the release of hostages. During the, the ceasefire that was mentioned um, earlier on, I think it was my colleague Ivan who mentioned it, out of 112 hostages who were released, 105 of them were released on the humanitarian um, perspective. That is absolutely essential. The other part of the motion that the Labour Party put down tonight that I think was really, really important was calling for the, secu the UN Security Council to meet as soon as possible because we need a path, a path to peace. A path to peace that allows the two-state solution, that allows the Israeli state to be safe, that allows the Palestinian state to exist because they have an inalienable right to exist. It is not in the gift of their neighbour to allow that. And we need to be supportive of all, all of those approaches to make sure that we have a, a, a path to peace because this cannot go on. And as Darren started um, the, the conversation earlier on saying, this has gone on for decades. It didn't start on the 7th of October, but it has to end soon. Was today a good day for politics and politicians? Today was a really, really, really grim day um, for, for, for all of us, actually, and for, for humanity in general, because as we are having these discussions, we are still in a situation where people are being killed because of what's happening in, in Gaza and Israel right now. And we have to remember, and I think it's really, really important, the Israeli people are not Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu, and the Palestinian people are not Hamas. And we have to keep a really, really, really clear and, and steady and calm head on all of that, because we know that when, when we don't, Islamophobia rises and anti-Semitism okay. rises, and we have to stand against that in all its forms in our communities. Donald here. McLeod, why are we letting politics get in the way of uh, achieving a ceasefire in Gaza? I thought today was a bad day for politics, without a doubt. Um, I, I don't think anybody came out of that looking good. Uh, least of all the speaker, you know, I thought that was uh, pretty bad. The blood, the bloodletting, the killing, slaughter has got to stop. Peace has got to be given a chance. And uh, how they get there, I don't, you know, far be it for me to, to see, see how they get there. It's very, very difficult, but I will say this. The, these islands here were riven by violence and atrocities for many, many years, decades, and called the Troubles, and, and it affected almost every facet of life in the UK. And I, if you were growing up during that time, you never, ever thought for a moment that the two sides, the two polarising sides, could ever get together and ever find a common purpose called peace. Well, I think... We look across the water at Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland and we see peace has been achieved. So no, no stone should be left unturned in trying to find a way 
to bring these parties together. And if all it means is our parties over here, from our point, get together and say, let's have a ceasefire, so be it. Let, and then, but let always work towards the peace because it's everybody's sick of the slaughter, really are. Okay, your views on all of this from home, please. The hashtag is BBCDN on social media. Tonight we're in Govan. Next week we're going to be in Dundee. The week after that we're going to be in Inverness. So if you'd like to come along and be part of the audience for the show, just go to the website bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night. Let's go to our second question of the night, which comes from Jim Sinclair. Jim, good evening. Following the EIS survey into violence in schools, what can be done to restore respect in our schools and generally in the whole society? Jim, thank you. So 800 <coughs> teachers were questioned as this. Uh, almost half reported violent pupil behaviour in school every day, and more than a third of those teachers said they had been physically assaulted. Pam Duncan Glancy, you say Labour are going to have a zero tolerance approach mm. to this. What does that mean? And, and we absolutely have to, because teachers are going to school worried. And, and they shouldn't be going to the workplace in fear um, of, of harassment or violence. Pupils are, have said over the summer um, last year in a national conversation that was held that the, one, the, the, the most important thing for them in education was to feel safe. I, I, I cannot believe we're in a situation in Scotland right now where the most important thing is for people to feel safe. Surely that should have been a given in the classroom that when you're there you feel safe. So what's zero Either in your workplace. Of that? Zero tolerance means that we must take action to, to not tolerate that. So if, if you have a situation where, as happened in Aberdeen um, and the EIS uh, survey, and have, have spoken about this this week, um, if you have a pupil come in. And, and punch a teacher who was pregnant, that teacher shouldn't have to go back into work the next day and face that What pupil about the pupils? The pupils that, should be excluded. So that, that's not what I'm saying, and I'll come back to that in a second. But the teacher should not have to go back into work that day and face, and face that, that pupil, because that is not an acceptable situation for the teacher. But to consider the, the, the notion of exclusion, I think we have to think about what that means. Because we cannot also just leave the young person to, to roam the streets. We still have to educate them. And what we have to remember is that most behaviour for a lot of people is a communication. And what, the, what we've seen in our schools and classrooms lately is as these, these violent incidences are the canary in the coal mine that under this SNP government, education is failing and teachers and pupils and parents are losing out. Right, OK. Uh, lady with the red hair. Yeah. Excuse me, all due respect, even the language that you're using to roam the streets, that would probably allude to the fact that they're feral, these kids. You're not taking into consideration that, uh, listen, in no way am I condoning anybody punching anybody, pregnant teacher, whatever, but what you're doing, I find that Labour, as, as well as Conservative, have this narrative to demonise people, to demonise anybody that, you know, that takes away the, the reflector what your actual mm. problems are and what you don't take notice of. So, whatever that's, so you use the words roam the street, yeah. so... You would take that would then allude that to maybe to the uneducated or maybe spoon feeding people that these people these queens don't have families and well listen you're, you're here in govern so probably the biggest rate of kids having issues and problems with school we've got the best school in govern high we've got the best school in Lourdes, like Lourdes uh, high school as well our wins on the feral so if we if there's issues like that which there is with govern high schools in govern mm. no one's going to be running the streets because we, we roam in the streets because there's families that love them okay. so but, can i just okay. say yeah. so she's stigmatized so that's alluding to stigmatization mm. and and that, and that fits right. both your parties' net and I, so, I will come back to you. Hang on a second. I want to yeah. hear from more people. The lady with the white trousers there, yes. I was actually doing um, a thing on the internet today just to see the stats for the education, right, and how well the education schools were doing. And, like, 8.8 .8 million people in 2023 were leaving without any education whatsoever, any qualifications. And that was in England and Wales under a Tory and Labour government. Okay, uh, gentlemen with the glasses. Yeah, on you go. The reason for the question <clears throat> was because yesterday in my grandkids' school, a parent appeared in the school with a baseball bat, with a couple of other boys, <laughs> knives, hammers, school locked down while they cleared the, the area. Today, the English teacher got injured in the classroom because of another fight breaking out in that school. You know, it's OK saying we've got to sort something. And I'm sitting here, and I don't, I don't know the answer. But, but you but think it's about respect? Cause you I think it's respect about respect. I, th I think we've lost all respect mm. for authority completely. You see what happens with the police, with the fire brigade, with ambulances, doctors. 
you know, they've been attacked all the time. It's right. ridiculous. But okay. I, and I'm, I'm not saying I've got the answer, but somehow or other we've got to get things changed. Right, let's get some answers from the panel. Darren McGarvey, have we lost respect for authority for teachers? It's earned. Respect goes both ways. And to be honest, yeah. no matter how far yeah. back, I really need to get in and finish that point and it sounds like I'm condoning violence against teachers. I'm not, although for the majority of universal education's duration, violence was tolerated and obligatory in the classroom and it was the teachers battering the kids. The second point re really is to say that this is becoming a feature of anyone who works in any public service. And so this is part of a deeper malaise where you have this convergence of stress and you have this convergence of trauma and dysfunction and poverty, not excuses for violence, don't ever mistake me as saying that people shouldn't be held accountable for their behaviour. But ultimately, these are, like, these are like lights flashing in the cockpit of an aircraft called society. And they flash all the time. And the problem is we confine the discussion to a specific area. This is violence in a school. Then tomorrow we'll be talking about abuse on public transport. And then we'll be talking about doctors getting shouted at. Really what we're seeing is an upswelling of, mm -hmm. of uh, anger and resentment which is expressed in very unhealthy ways by people who haven't been raised properly because they themselves grew up in conditions of social deprivation. And if you go into any of our prisons, you're going to find where all that ends. It ends in prison, which is actually more expensive than just educating them properly, than just providing what people need to develop properly. Let's hear from more of the audience here. Man in the middle, here in the front row. Hi, you talk about respect. When I went to school when I was a wee boy, our parents told us to respect um, teachers, policemen, anyone in authority. And we did. And we got respect back. So it doesn't start from a teacher's children, they have to respect the child. The child has to respect the, the person that's in charge. And we don't get that at the moment. The kids, Good luck telling a kid that these days, pal. Listen, because, the, kids, because, the, kids, because, the kids, the kids, the kids do not respect adults. I know that. I've, I've walked I've, I've walked along Mary Hill Street and Mary Hill and been spat. Why? Well, it never used to happen when I was a kid. We never used to do that. So at this precise moment, kids do not respect authority. It never happened when you were a kid. When did you grow up? Listen, it's, it's all down to social media. This is a myth. I'm sorry. It's not, it's not a myth. It is. It's I don't know where you live. Do you grow up in Mulgay or something? No, no. I was born... <laughs> hey, listen, I was born in the West End. I was born in St George's Cross, right? I'm an Asian. I was called all the names you wanted to be called, right? But the problem was that we respected the people in charge. These days, there is no respect. None. Well, maybe. None at all. Sorry, John. Hope, hope the first I'll get more people from the audience and I'll yeah. come back to you. Mm. Man with the long hair there, yes. Yes, I do. Um, I'm interested in the narrative from the Labour Party concerning this zero tolerance policy. Um, very eloquently underlined exactly what everybody's feeling the down of society at the minute the abhorrence of violence in schools mm. and in the NHS and in public sector. Um, I've yet to hear your zero tolerance policy. Okay, okay. What's your action plan? Okay, Pam, I will, I will come Thank back you. to you again in a second. In the middle there, the blue shirt and the white t-shirt underneath. Yes. Yeah, as someone who works um, in education, I think the sort of violence that we're seeing um, pupil on pupil and pupil towards staff in the schools, it just indicates how much the council budgets have been stripped yes. down to the barest bones. Yep. If these people cannot get pupils, parents, they're not getting the need, their needs supported, they're not getting doctor's appointments, many of them won't have been to a dentist in a long time, how are we going to expect that they're coming into school ready to learn? Okay, the question is, what can be done about uh, violence in schools and reintroducing respect? Brian Whittle. I think this is a multifaceted problem. You know, it's not. It's, there's, there's not just one, you know, silver bullet for this. You know, we, we, you know, we, we could we could talk about that. There's a huge rise in ASN um, re requirements of pe people with, with special needs. At the same time, there's a huge reduction in ASN teachers. There's five and a half thousand teachers on temporary contracts um, at, at a time when we have shortage in teachers. But, but it's more than that. It, it, it's, it's a societal problem. Um, in, in terms of reduction of services, reduction of what's available in the communities. It, 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 it's, it's so multifaceted. I mean, my, my daughter, my eldest daughter is, is, is a teacher. She's, she's head of guidance in one of, one of the sort of major school, schools 
in Ayrshire, and she's dealing dealing with with the so-called trouble pupils all the time. And I've, I've got to be honest, you know, it, my view has changed dramatically because of, of her, because she's she's dealing with these pupils. I mean, she tells me the background to some of the, the pupils with the, with with with, with the, you know that, that are they're perpetrating this kind of behaviour, and sometimes you say, no wonder, no wonder. So. We, we have, so it's not about respect. It, it is about. It, it, we, we, we have. We have. We're a, as a society, I think definitely we have. Uh, uh, we have a drop in, in respect. There's, there's not as much respect for, for teachers the way they used to be. But if we put teachers under enormous amounts of pressure, if we don't have enough teachers in the classroom, if we don't have enough uh, teachers to, to to speak to the, the issues that these the, the, the children have, the inevitability is that. It's going to come out in some way or other, and and the the, you know, the anger or the frustration is coming out. I, I I also have a friend who is an ESN teacher, and every single day, one of the pupils will hit her in some way, one form or one form or another, because she's the only one. We need we need we need to we need to actually stop talking politics and actually look at the the problems we're trying to solve here, and actually put put in place the issue, you know, tackle the issues we're trying to solve here, rather than come up with big grandiose statements. Okay. You know, it's, it's a Pam, I will come to you on this, but there's so many hands up in the audience. Lady with the scarf from the second row here. Yeah, on you go. There's too many chiefs and not enough Indians, I say. Um, the fact that the parents take their children to an after school before they go to school. Then the after school, after school. They never get any time for the parents to even discipline them in the first place. So why can you expect them to have any respect for their parents, never mind anybody else out there? And then they've got babysitters at the weekend because the parents have been working all week so they feel it's time to go out and get, uh, chill down, have a drink. I mean, they're not spending enough time. It just doesn't work. Two people out working all the so, time. So it's, it's pa this all stems from parenting as far yeah, as Yeah, I believe stem. it's oh, down to parenting. All right, uh, gentlemen with the glasses here. It goes back to a funding issue because it's just all these kids are not should not be demonised. Um, they should be. I um, was um, lucky enough to actually be in a support system for um, learning difficulties, and it really helped me. And most of these kids who shouldn't be demonised, it's not just about respect. Um, they just need that little bit of guidance to actually help them and grow as a person. Okay, thank you. Other lady in the staff here. Yes, let me go. Thank you. I think that what we've lost is the community bringing up a child. Uh, everybody, uh, the children know their, their rights, but they don't know their responsibilities. When the teachers have issues with the, with, the, with, the, with the pupils, I get a call, or oh, your son's done so, he's coming home, just wait for him. Instead of uh, us dealing together, uh, dealing with the, ch uh, the pupils together, so we, we've lost all that, and the child now knows, oh, okay, I can, I can just uh, do whatever I want, because my, my parent will do nothing. When I was growing up, I'd get trouble at school, I'd go home and I'd get the same trouble. I'd be on the, on the street, I'd get, uh, everybody would be looking out for, for you know, wh whatever yeah. you're doing. If, if, say for instance, you, you hit a bus with a stone, nobody, nobody dares say anything. So we've all lost that control, we've all lost that respect. They used, the, they used to say it takes a village to bring up a child. It used to, yeah, it takes yeah. a village to bring a child. Do, do, Donald McLeod, how do we deal with this violence in schools? It's been on the rise since 2016 in Scotland. I'll be honest, I was a wee bugger when I was at school, right? And I got expelled, and my father had to come in and speak to teachers so that I could sit and do the exams. I was only allowed in to do the exams. And there was a couple of incidents back then, not with me, but with others in my school. But I look at it now, and I think nobody should go to their work scared of, and be assault, of us being assaulted. That has to be dealt with. I don't allow it in the clubs. They get expelled. They get put out. Kids shouldn't be demonised, I agree. But there should be a provision there from the Scottish Government to look after, to take those you know, identify these kids and look after them in a, in a specially resourced uh, area. However, there are some people getting broken bones. Teachers are terrified to go in. This, and it's not just in Scotland, and I should say this, this is happening in the length and breadth of the UK. So there's a major problem. But nobody should go to their work scared. Nobody should be uh, getting assaulted at their job. Yep. Full stop. So, uh, serious action should be taken. Expulsions must be carried out 
but then identified who are, you know, what can we do then, and, and that's up to government. Right, uh, up to the government. Ivan McKee, what are we going to do about this? Yeah, so, first of all, a few points. Donald's right, if you look at the data on this, it's not just a Scottish problem, that doesn't excuse it, and we absolutely need to focus on it, but it talks to a, a, a broader issue. NASUWT, the Teachers Union down south, did a survey at the end of last year, and came up with very similar results about, about the issue. So there's clearly a, a, a general trend there that needs to, be, needs to be addressed. And I just want to take a minute and talk about, in my job as a constituency MSP, um, as I'm sure Pam and, and Brian do as well. You go into schools, you meet young people, you talk to them about uh, answer their questions, school groups come to the parliament and you meet them. Um, and to be honest, the vast, vast majority of those young people I'm very impressed with, they're very switched on, they ask some great questions, they're really interested in uh, what, what, what my job is and, and all kinds of other issues that they want to uh, ask about and find out about. And, and, and that's kids from, to be fair, across section, right across Glasgow, because there's some very uh, challenged uh, communities that I, I, I've got the honour to, to represent um, and are very impressed with those young people. And I think if you look back in time, and I think Darren's right here, but, um, that thinking back to when I was at school, get the belt from your teacher, that violence was just part of what was going on. Um, and we've come a long way from that time. But it's and been getting worse since 2016. South of the border here. This is, so yeah, how are we going right, to address it? Right. But it's, it's something that's going right back. So if you, look, you need to look at the root causes of, of this, and there's a whole range of different things. You're absolutely right, Pam's absolutely right. Nobody should be going to their work and having to put up with that. Um, the exclusion process does exist for schools, but if all you're doing is moving that problem from one place in that environment to a different environment where, where they cause other kinds of problems, you're not really fixing the problem. So it's, it's a long process, but understanding what the, the root causes of that and working with individuals and being able to address the, the challenge. The respect issue is usually an important part of that. And Darren's right again, if that then cascades its, its way down and you end up with those young people ending up in the justice system, that's the last thing you want. So you're not to catch that early and deal with it as an issue. Um, the the government's got a job to, to do in this, and I know that government's put extra money in to support schools and be able to deal with that um, as a consequence of these challenges and working uh, with schools and those in the education system with the action plan they've got to help address that. Um, but that needs to be unpicked a bit at a time and understand what the issue is. And parents got a role as well. And there's some great organisations out there doing parent support. I mean, I've been a parent, I've got four kids. It's probably the hardest job you ever do um, is raising those kids and making sure that uh, you, you do everything you can for them and, 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 and support them through all the challenges that they face. So that's a, a, a big part of it and support yeah, well, with parents as well. Darren, Darren, Darren you're, a, you're a parent. What do you say to your kids about respect? My kids, I mean, I'm, I understand and I'm fortunate enough to kind of see this from multiple perspectives. And I know if I want to give my kids the best chance, then I have to create a safe, encouraging, nurturing environment for them to hit all of their developmental milestones so that they're not at a developmental disadvantage in an under-resourced education system where their diverse needs behaviourally in terms of their attitude, their emotions are not being met because we haven't managed to move the needle enough to account for diversity of that sort, because it's easier to discipline mm. and treat punitively. And um, the thing that, that we have to understand, just to go back to this gentleman, because I know he's not happy with what I said, so I just want to make him even more unhappy. As the point, as the point, I was being facetious, right? But it's because I take that offensively, what you, you say, that, we've you got a different way of looking at you, it. No, no, you, you looked at me, you thought, I spoke, you thought, you, he must come from a... A posh um, place. A posh place. I don't. So that's ridiculous to put up. Uh, you shouldn't judge okay. a book by the well, cover. Would it help if so I apologise just... for that? No, I don't mind. You can click. Right. That doesn't matter where I come from. Can I from. just get on with my point? Mm, that's fine. Right. So for, for me, really, ultimately, a kid who's acting violent in a classroom, they're acting violent because they've learned to act out violence. They're either a victim of violence or they're witnessing violence regularly. And so this becomes a tool in their kit to meet their needs and get what they want. Now, trust me, as abhorrent as that violence is, and as much as it should be held accountable, and I'd be the first one to look in a wee guy's mm -hmm. eyes in a young offender's institution, in a residential school for people with support needs. All these environments I've worked in say, wee man, you need to get it together. But if you knew what these kids have seen, if you knew what these kids have been through, it's a miracle some of them are still alive. Can I, Pam, Pam, today? I want, I want to give you a chance just to answer the point that that man made, who um, still isn't clear what you mean about zero tolerance of this. Absolutely. What are you going to do about it? Absolutely, and, and I'll come to that, because I'd, I'd like to also address the woman's point earlier on. Um, and the point I was making is about exclusions. People often say, well, that has to mean exclusions then. And the point I was making was, 
what, are we just going to just leave kids and not, and not educate them? That isn't acceptable. What we need to do is make sure that young people have the support that they need to learn in the way that is best for them. Right now, almost 40% of our classrooms are pupils with additional support needs. But over the last 10 years, we've seen a cut to specialist teachers for pupils with additional support needs. And we've got a situation right now where there is one educational psychologist per 630 pupils. Those are the sorts of circumstances that we cannot tolerate. And that is what I have zero tolerance for. We cannot tolerate a situation where we have a government that has underfunded councils, underfunded education, cut back support for pupils with additional support needs and expect everything to be all right in the classroom because that is not what's going to happen. We've got okay. cl classrooms that are like pressure cookers because children are being failed, they're not getting the support they need and teachers are not getting the support they need okay. and it's children, parents and teachers that are losing out. All right. Uh, what do you think? Watching this at home, the hashtag is BBCDN on social media. We've got a lot to get through tonight, so let's go to our third question. A lot of questions around this area this evening. This one, though, comes from uh, Fiona Campbell. Fiona, good evening. Thank you. I'm concerned that Glasgow and probably other cities across Scotland is becoming increasingly neglected looking. Issues such as littering, fly tipping and graffiti, as well as potholed, uneven and persistently flooded pavements and roads. How can civic pride be restored? A lot of concern at the moment about the state of Scotland's biggest city. I think a third of the shops in Sucky Hall Street as well, empty at the moment. Donald MacLeod, you've written about this, you've talked about this. How can civic pride be restored here? <laughs> How do we restore it? 30 years ago, um, when I started my business in, in Sucky Hall Street, um, I'd already started further down in uh, Union Street, there was a lot of civic pride. There was buses, there was movement, people went out, people enjoyed stuff. Yeah, it wasn't perfect. There was graffiti, there was dirt, there was litter, but not like it is today. So what's changed? Uh, lack, of, lack of investment, a lack of care. Um, I, I think the, 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 I don't think the council's done a great job in recent years of looking after the place. I, I don't think the Scottish Government have, have, have equally given them the funds to do that. I think it's been a, a mess, actually. We have been, from my business, we have been neglected, we've been ignored. The hospitality sector has been treated appallingly all the way through. So from the back end of the pandemic to today, it's one worry after another. Uh, Costs have went up, we all know that cost of living went up, we all know that energy prices are through the roof, but there's been no real support and for a sector, my sector, the third biggest employer in Scotland, there's been no real support at all from the Scottish Government. Scant regard has been given to it, it's been treated contemptuously. The money that was meant, earmarked for us, has been withheld or passed on somewhere else. And we're not even given the rates allowance, uh, the, the rates relief that was allowed in England. We are neglecting hospitality, therefore we're neglecting jobs, we're neglecting our streets, we're neglecting, the, 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 you know, we put in LEZ, my God, we bring that in, and then we increase parking charges. It's as if we're trying to stop people coming into Glasgow. And, yeah. I mean, you would think they'd lost their marbles. Well, they'll deny that, but I'm sure there's a big, huge hole in the bag, man, because it's, they, they really have lost the plot because they're now increasing the parking from six o'clock to 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So that is going to impact on, on workers within the trade who, you know, they can barely afford their, their, to come in. And, you know, they're not the most highly paid, you know, except in my place, of course. But, you know, when they come in, <laughs> When they come in, they've not got a lot of money, they've got cars and they pay parking and now they've got to run out every two hours to do it. And okay. who's going to come in for a meal, a restaurant and park up and then two hours run out again, another 20 right. quid, you know, it's, it's a joke, Donald, it's let, terrible. Let, let's hear from the audience on this. Man in the green sweater down in the front here, how do we restore civic pride in Glasgow? It's a very good question. Can I just say that, that this morning actually I was out in Drumchapel, that's where I stay, 
uh, with a pensioner and a member of the council identifying all the potholes, all the, the gullies that need uh, mm. unblocked, all the fly tipping, all the dog poo, right? A, a tremendous amount of, of uh, like, what we'd call antisocial, kind of a community disparate, right? That puts people's heads down, mm -hmm. right? People are fed up with the same old issues all the time and trying to get the council to respond to us. So we had to take the council down there this morning and identify it all and then hopefully they'll take a bit of action on it and clear up the place because if we're trying to restore people's pride in communities I know you're talking about the city centre right that, that's a different issue from communities like from chapel mm -hmm. right I mean we we've been battered and bruised for for years and years and, and we're trying to get people to respect their area Right, and uh, I mean, the same will go for Paul and Govan, and I'm sure other places, Mary Hill. Uh, we've got, uh, we're getting into a period now where all the cutbacks are really hitting communities that are disadvantaged, right? And we can't take it anymore. And the council need to, and the Scottish government need to respond to all this instead of going round in circles all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Hear you loud and clear. Lady on the aisle there with the blonde hair. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I work within Glasgow City Council. I'm a union convener. So uh, over the last nearly two decades, the demise of the public services in this city for the tax that is paid by the people of this city to the government, they are not getting it back. They are cutting services. They are outsourcing services. They are when there's workers are retiring or anything, there's no workers getting replaced. What they are doing is they are turning this, it's, it's all about money. Money, money, money. It's the same with the care service. There is no care anymore. It's about, it's all about profit making and numbers fitting. It's not about these workers out in the street and about the litter and the potholes and the parks or anything. It is about when there's a big thing comes to Glasgow, it's brilliant, COP26, <laughs> everything. Let's get everything out there. You know, the cycling championships come. Let's get this part of the city sorted up. Get these weeds up and everything. They have, the pride has been taken out of Glasgow over the last two decades and it needs to be sorted. We need the Scottish Government to start giving money back to Glasgow City Council so that we can set it back up again okay. and get our pride back. Okay. Adam McKee, that lady says the pride has been taken out of the city of Glasgow. Well, I think it's a great city. lived here all my life and uh, I go abroad and you talk about Glasgow, very proud of what it's accomplished in the past and what it's accomplishing now. Um, and we all recognise that there are, there are issues out there. Um, and the council works at sending out the councillors to identify this stuff. The councillors that I know spend time doing that every week uh, of the year, going out and identifying where the issues are in their communities and then getting, making sure that the council services are coming out to address those because that's an important, important part of their job. Um, but if you're talking about that coming back to funding, money's gone from the government to the council. Right. Um, at the end of the day, the government's got a limited amount of money. We don't have the ability to borrow any more money. It's a decision on where that money goes. Does it go to the health service? Does it go to the councils? Does it go to education? where does that money go? Um, so the government works as hard as it can to get that money out to the right places. Now, there might be decisions about what the priority is, there might be issues about what the priority are within different councils, and every one of the 32 <coughs> councils is going to take a different perspective on what they're doing about that. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right, those services need to be provided, and there's nothing worse than you're driving along the road and you hit the big pothole, or you look out and you see uh, the, the, the place, it's a mess, it should be tidied up. Can you remember like, a time when Glasgow looked worse than it does at the moment? Um, since you've been in MSP, since you've been in politics? Well, I think you look back your whole life, you would look back and say, has it, has it been worse at particular points in time? Since you've been um, in politics? I wouldn't say it's any worse. I mean, if you look back over the last six or seven years, um, I, I, I would say that there's, um, that there's issues just now. Certainly, I would say with, with, with potholes, are certainly issues, um, and that's probably worse mm. than it's been. Um, I'm going to say. Blanchard. I um, I have to say, I'm, a, I'm astonished and I, I, I'm proud of our city. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of the people who live and work in our city. I'm proud of the people who do everything they possibly can to keep this city going in, a, in very, very difficult circumstances. But the reality is, 
The cuts that your government have passed down to local councils have absolutely decimated services. Everything that we've just heard about what's happening in the streets, the potholes, the lack of support for our parks, the lack of upgrading in them, the, the LEZ that's meant that businesses are really struggling um, so within the city centre. So what would Labour do differently? Well, we would have, so we put forward a budget, the, the Labour councillors put forward a budget in Glasgow that had a really forward focus, that would have brought investment into the city, that would have used unspent money, by the way, on the Glasgow Loves Local um, Club uh, fund that the, the, the SNP brought in, unspent money, we would have put that back into communities. We'd have put £6 million into fixing the roads and potholes. Because when I was recently out, um, I did a walk around um, with a group of people who have had visual impairments. Some of those people, when they're walking around our city, one person um, spoke about a time where they were walking with a white stick in front of them they, and it stuck in the, pot, the pothole. They broke their ribs. This is a situation in our city that is not just looks bad, it actually means that the city is now difficult for people to navigate. Disabled people feel that they're being frozen out of it because they can't get around it easily. And people can see what's happening in their streets because we've, we've not supported cleansing workers for decades. And we're really in a situation where okay. we cannot take another penny of cuts by the SNP government. Back in right. Right. Go, quick yeah. I hear what Pam's saying, but the idea that Labour's got the answer to this is nonsense. Labour, three Labour councils didn't even turn up to vote for the budget, and one of them was away on a cruise. Actually, seriously, they took it. And I... the, the, the reality you're talking about, in one hand, there's not enough money, in the other hand, there's money that's underspent. Make your mind up, which is it? And the Labour, reality no, is that no, Labour did no, run Glasgow for budget. years, Pam, no, as well. Not, Labour did run Glasgow. Really, really Labour did run Glasgow for years, really but it never looked like this when we were running it. And the point that you're making about there's either no money or there's unspent money, the Make point I was up. making, the point I was making about that money is, first of all, the SNP government, because they've not, they have not grown the economy. The economy, the economy across the rest of the UK has grown faster than Scotland. So you've not grown the economy. Not you've not supported businesses in Glasgow to bring in investment. And the money that wasn't spent on the Glasgow Loves Local Card, the, the one example I gave, wasn't spent because of the incompetence of your administration. None of this. No, 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 no. I came back to you. None of this is fixed in Glasgow. Let's try and find some solutions. Brian Whittle. I think one of the things that, that, uh, that, that, that I, I get this made about here is, is the fact that you know cutting money to the councils is such a false economy, because it's, I mean, we talked about education, not you know, in the, in the last question, and education is the responsibility of the council. So if you cut money to the councils, you're cutting money to education, you're cutting money to services, you're cutting money to things like sport and art and music and drama. We can't have that. And, and the introduction of the LEZ in, into Glasgow, I was there uh, in Parliament and, and tried to put some amendments into Parliament around that. I agree that we, we, we need to cut emissions in the town, but if you do that, you have to put, uh, you still have to have the ability to get into the city. Mm -hmm. You still have to have the ability to get around the city. And they put the LEZ into Glasgow without that consideration. And there's, if you want to put the, the, uh, um, you know, the pride back into to Glasgow, you can't have you know, streets and streets where what all you're seeing is two let signs. You have to support the business. The nighttime economy is getting dis destroyed because you can't get into the city, you can't get out of the city. Hospitality work, is getting destroyed. Workers, the workers can't sector. get in and out. Well, you know, workers who work you know, late hours can't get home at night. Mm. You, have to, you have to put a structure in place that allows the economy to develop and to okay. grow. Right, okay, okay. Darren McGarvey. Darren McGarvey. Yeah. I just want to make a point about a specific sector that Glasgow has been renowned for that nobody's touched on. Music. Obviously. Music. Yeah, exactly. Now I come out of the music industry and there are break sub the substrands of that, like poetry and yeah. other kinds of art yeah. and scenes. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I've got a friend, right? Mark McGee, his name is. And he's one of the many unsung heroes in Scotland who's always working hard to put on and platform new artists. A lot of artists that later get into the higher levels of the industry, they begin at that level. He's part of the most important tier of the music industry where the real creativity and freshness is happening all the time. Now let me tell you what he done after lockdown. He gave up on this city and got some money together and effed off to South America. And it wasn't given up like he didn't have it in him to fight for the industry that he's been involved in all his life. It's that the amount of barriers in the face of particularly working class artists. I mean, that ABC venue that got burned down as a result of the second art school fire, that was one of the biggest venues that working class artists could do a support slot with a big international act that would start their career off, all their friends would go, they would stay in that part of the city all night 
No, it's just a junk food chewing gum turd gauntlet to walk at night. <laughs> and I don't have all the answers, but I don't, I, I think it's distasteful sometimes when we try to attribute political blame because we know that these, pro these problems are fundamental, they're structural. Where is the money? Who knows? 17 million a day firing a miss dummy nuclear missile that then he goes far as my six-year-old daughter could have thrown it for a nuclear program that cost 200 billion pounds and everybody's saying, where's all the money to get the bins taken out? Well, no, we, we, we have got so many hands up in the room, I know, on this. But we did want to get to one more question this evening, and we just have time, thanks to him and that link. And it comes from Craig Campbell. Craig, good evening. Uh, Darren just alluded to after the failure of Trident, should we be really worried about how much or how little protection we have? Uh, thank you. Craig, what do you think? So this is the second time that a Trident test has 20 failed. 20 years ago, we went to Russia on our honeymoon. We thought it was amazing, and it was becoming, it was become more friendly towards the West, blah, 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 perestroika and all that. This guy is a psychopath and... President Putin. He's terrifying. What we've seen him do with uh, Navalny. Uh, we're also worried that China sides with him when we take him on. And these things, as you say, they fire about six feet and nothing happens. So... OK. And we've got it all based in Scotland. Uh, how so. much protection do we actually have, <laughs> uh, is the question from Craig this evening. Brian Whittle. Well, one of the th one I think that I would start off by saying, I think, you know, uh, nuclear weapons are an abhorrent uh, uh, con construct by the human race. However, um, as you alluded to, sir, um, we cannot leave Vladimir Putin and, and China and, and, and the likes, um, and God help us if, you know, if Iran ever got nuclear weapons or whatever, we, we, we cannot allow that. So it's either all or none. But how does it look to him if he sees us testing for a second time and not I mean, working? I, th I think uh, 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 from, from, from what, I've, what I gather from that is, is that, that is, uh, 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 and using dummy uh, missiles, that's how they, 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 they test to make sure that the, the, the actual Trident missiles are safe in the, in, in the end. Um, and the, the, we, can't, we can't decide, if we, could, if we decided not to have nuclear weapons in the UK, all we're doing is passing responsibility on to other countries to, 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 protect, to protect us. Um, I mean, I, 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 would, I would love a situation where, globally, we could completely and utterly wipe out. I mean, actually, something like 90% of nuclear weapons, you know, since the 70s, uh, have been removed uh, uh, from, from the world, and that trajectory has to keep going. But the, the bottom line is, when you have people like Vladimir Putin, do you want him to be the last person? OK, Ivan McKee. You know? It's, I mean, our position in the SNP is that uh, nuclear weapons are a waste of money, and worse than that, 200 billion that Darren identified, um, worse than that, they actually prevent resources going to uh, the rest of the armed forces, and what the armed forces will tell you that, um, that, that is more useful and more effective for what we need, uh, we need, uh, we need resources for, um, for defence. Um, and the point about this, if it's supposed to be a deterrent, at least if you've not you tried it, you can say it's a deterrent. Once you've tried it and it's been shown not to work, it stops being a deterrent, which totally defeats the whole purpose. So it is a waste of money. Um, and, and, and Brian's right, they're totally uh, uh, abhorrent um, uh, um, uh, weapon that should, should never be used. Um, and uh, our position is, and, and also they're based very close to Glasgow, which makes us a target. Um, I so our position is that we just, we, 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 we complete, uh, completely th unnecessary. There have been, I think, about spending two, the 200, two, billion 200 on tests something more where useful. They, they, they have, have been successful, but the last two certainly haven't. Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I think this is um, really, really worrying, and, and I would hope that the Defence Secretary will, will update Parliament on what happened and what he's going to do about it. Because one of the things that, and one of the first things that people tell us is that they need to feel safe. So I think it's incredibly important that the Defence Secretary is brought to Parliament and held accountable for that. But one of the other things that we need to focus on, and, and Brian, you didn't mention this um, in, in your response there, but we've seen a reduction in defence staff under the, the, the current UK government, and that is not an acceptable situation, particularly when we face the, the, the tyrants that, like we do um, in Putin. That's why I think it's really important that the work um, that my colleague John Healy is doing on this and is calling for a defence review. Um, if we were to be in government, that's one of the first things that we would do. And I think that's really important because okay. we need to be able to understand okay, um, okay. What, what goes well. I really want to hear wrong. from the audience on this. A gentleman down in the front row first on it here. Yeah, go on. Uh, Ukraine was uh, conned into giving up their nuclear weapons by Russia, and where are we now with that? I, I, I think it is the point, though. You know, if, if, 
we were in a situation here, imagine, where everybody had given up their nuclear weapons, bar Russia, where would we be right now? And I think, you know, we, we need rid of all of them. It's all of them, okay. I think. And, and just to, to, to palm no, plans, no, we don't have time. We don't, have, we don't, we don't have time. Donald McLeod. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember the way back in the, the, the Cold War and the Russian bombers, I think they're using the same ones, flying about the British Isles and we were all freaked out then. But let's face it, the nuclear deterrent has kept us safe, in my view, all these years. When do we get rid of it? Why should we get rid of it? Well, that's, that's some way off, I think, with Putin on the horizon and, and China amassing in the, 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 the South Pacific. I think it's, it would be a very dangerous, very silly and stupid thing to do is to get rid of the one thing that they might be scared of. And uh, whether they, they can maybe get Elon Musk to fix uh, the boosters on them uh, be something else. OK, let me hear from the gentleman with the glasses there. Talking about how uh, Trident has, has, has possibly failed these two tests out of, out of 200 tests, the one question that no one seems to be able to answer, and no one probably will be able to answer in here, is how effective are Russian nuclear weapons? <laughs> uh, we've got so 40 we seconds left in the programme, and it, l it lands to Darren McGarvey to... How effective are what? <laughs> Russian nuclear weapons. <laughs> how many tests have they done? We don't know that, do we? Yeah, exactly. I mean, to be fair, they have been tested. I think the reason it's went wrong is because Grant Shapps was actually present at the test. <laughs> and anything that he comes within a five-mile radius of is doomed to end in a really painful anticlimax. <laughs> we literally have 20 seconds left. Lady with the glasses there to finish things off. On you go. The rest of the conversation this evening has been about how there's been so many cuts and not enough money left for the public services. It's eroding civic society. I think there's almost no country left to defend if we keep funding Trident and not funding the rest of the needs of mm. our nation. Yeah. Thank you. We're out of time, I'm afraid. It's such a quick 60 minutes. Uh, your views at home, though, hashtag is BBCDN. Keep the conversation going on social media. And um, that's it. Next week, we're going to be in Dundee. The week after that, Inverness. You can apply to be on those shows via the website. If you missed any of tonight's programme, it's repeated a bit later on BBC One Scotland, or you can watch any time that suits you on the BBC iPlayer. Thank you very much indeed to my panel here tonight and to our brilliant audience in Govan and, of course, to you at home for watching. We'll see you next week in Dundee. In the meantime, Stay safe, stay well from all of us in debate night. Good night.